dog stop barking. Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's lunchtime lecture series. Just a few housekeeping regulations. Please, everybody, except for, for David, mute your microphone and keep your video off, please. Our sponsor today, in case I forget as usual, is Pitto Associates. And our speaker is David Hull, and he is an associate professor in applied and environmental geology at the University of Leicester. He received a BSc in geology from Durham University, followed by an MSc in mining geology at the Camborne School of Mines, where he first dabbled in South African geology. Taking a or undertaking a research project on the Marinsky Reef with Grant Cawthorn. Uh, please put your video off. After a short period in engineering geology, he returned to Bushveld Research to complete a PhD on the Platte Reef with Anglo American based at Cardiff University with Ian McDonald. Since then, he has worked as an exploration geologist and consultant and for the past 11 years has been based at the University of Leicester, where his research focuses on magmatic and hydrothermal ore deposits and applying knowledge of the processes that form these deposits to exploration and mining models through a multidisciplinary approach of fieldwork, mineralogy or mineralogical, petrological, geochemical and isotopic analysis. His primary research centers around magmatic, nickel, copper, cobalt, and PGE deposits across the world. So, David, we thoroughly look forward to your presentation this morning. Please go ahead. Okay, okay. thank you, Tanya. And thank you, Nolene. Uh, thanks for the invite. Uh, good to be back in South Africa, sort of, as, as, as best we can, at least. Okay, so, um, I'm going to talk to you today about the Minali uh, nickel sulfide deposit in southern Zambia. Uh, I'm going to set it up in terms of the uh, what classic nickel sulfide deposits around Craton margins are and, uh, and, and go through that as a sort of a framework to, to uh, show you some of the features uh, of Minali. Um, I will say that uh, this is work that we've been doing at the University of Leicester with um, consolidated nickel mines in Ibiza. Um, for the past um, five and a half years. Uh, so a lot of what I'm going to present are um, results from a number of studies, um, including some master's projects and in particular a PhD project which is nearing its conclusion uh, by Daryl Blanks as well. So um, a lot of the stuff uh, that I'm going to show you is, is coming out of that study. Okay, so I thought just to start off with, uh, we give a little bit of background on magmatic nickel, copper, cobalt, PGE sulfide deposits. Um, just, I mean, I'm sure many of you are quite familiar with these, but just to, to pick up on a couple of themes that we can then pick up on uh, with Manali as well. Um, I put cobalt in there because cobalt is becoming a, a more important uh, byproduct of these things, and they are our major source of nickel and the battery quality nickel as well, sulfide nickel as opposed to um, uh, laterite nickel. Uh, obviously a source of copper as well and our largest source um, of PGE. And in terms of uh, mineralogy, they're quite a simple old deposit type to look at in a way. There's, we've got pyrotite, pentlandite, chalcopyrite as our main uh, ore minerals, maybe some pyrite. Um, and platinum group minerals as well, um, and a few different gang phases, which I will touch upon um, a little bit later. So um, this is a cartoon from one of uh, Wolf Meyer's papers, and it shows a very sort of uh, schematic representation of a mafic, ultramafic uh, magma system, where we've got towards the base, and we've got conduits, so these might be dikes, sills, and then up into a layered mafic intrusion. Um, and the deposit types that, that we can get in these uh, sort of systems, they can, they can pretty much occur anywhere. The ones down in the base um, and in the conduits, particularly um, in dike sill complexes, they tend to be the ones which are really sulfide rich. They're the ones that look spectacular and they tend to be the nickel rich deposits. So that's, that's what we're looking at, nickel and sulfur rich. 
Um, so examples of that, um, South Africa, eight comps, uh, Kabanga in um, uh, Tanzania, Niril Chinchuan, uh, Manali fits in there as well. And then as you go up the sort of stratigraphy, if you like, in um, in the layered mafic complexes, uh, you tend to get less and less sulfide, but your PGE tenors tend to get higher and higher. So that uh, a Marensky reef, for example, in these um, ultra mafic cumulates, it's got, that's a PGE deposit with a little bit of copper and nickel. And then the extreme examples you can find up in the really upper parts of some intrusions in magnetite rich gabbros. Uh, for example, uh, um, in South Africa, the Stella complex which has PGEs associated with uh, magnetite and very very little sulfide but we're going to concentrate on the ones down towards the base of these and there's a bit of a contrast here between um, the type of deposit and where they are found so the red dots on here are the PG rich uh, deposits and you can see they are clustered within cratons um, and the yellow dots on there, those are the nickel rich deposits, and they are more or less uh, correlated with the edge of cratons. Um, we'll go to southern Africa, um, and you can see the, the big red dots there are your layered mafic intrusions. So the Bushveld right in the middle of the Katmval craton, Stella in there as well, and the Great Dyke, of course, right in the middle of the Zimbabwe craton. And then we've got uh, the nickel rich deposits, which are more towards the margin. So we've got um, Kabanga up here in Tanzania, Akela Congo, um, which is a fairly newly discovered deposit up in uh, Uganda, um, Salevi Peque, and there's Manali there, sat right on the edge. So magmatic sulfide deposits, you have PG dominant ones in layered mafic complexes and nickel rich ones in more conduit dike sill complexes on the craton margins. So why are they found on craton margins? Well, um, this, uh, this sort of spatial association was um, found um, and published about a decade ago in a paper by Graham Begg, a couple of other papers around about that same time, uh, Dave Groves, Wolf Meyer as well. Um, and it found that most of the world's big nickel camps, so in Canada here we've got Thompson Nickel Belt, um, Raglan, uh, Voises Bay, um, Jin Chuan there, and then uh, Norilsk as well, and if we go into Southern Africa we've got those ones that I mentioned earlier. They're located around the Kraton margin. So the uh, question is why? Well, the theory is that this is all linked to continental, uh, supercontinent breakup. Plumes impinge on the base of the subcontinental lithospheric mantle and where continents are breaking up you start to get lithospheric thinning and these plumes can channel themselves round into those areas of thinned uh, lithosphere um, and you open up um, uh, sedimentary basins, rift basins and that is a focus for this magnetism and so as those supercontinents break apart, you end up with cratons and around the margins, this is where we've had this magnetism. And these are brilliant sites to form nickel sulfide deposits because that lithospheric thinning forms deep seated translithospheric fault systems. Okay, and what they're great for is their pathways. So this hot uh, mantle melts with our metals in, they have the ability to migrate up these uh, deep seated fault systems and they form these dike sill conduit uh, systems, hopefully with ore bodies because they get uh, plenty of opportunity there to um, interact with country rocks um, and crustal contamination is one of the big triggers for nickel sulfide uh, genesis. The morphology of these things is uh, very different to your layered mafic intrusion. These are much smaller. We've got um, sort of uh, sill type uh, intrusion, dikes, uh, the chonolith, which is a very prospective um, sort of pipe like uh, tube intrusions, and then these ones, um, which are sort of more hybrid versions uh, between them, tube or funnel like. This is from a paper by Steve Barnes. These the ones at the bottom are referred to as Steve Barnes hairdryer type. Uh, intrusions and you can note that the sulfides tend to be towards the base of these which is the um, purpley pink oh look that's a little heart shape in that one I just noticed that 
um, towards the base of the sulfides uh, accumulate in ultramafic cumulants. So if we take that towards a sort of an exploration model, um, we can do uh, pretty well by heading towards craton margins to begin with. Uh, we want lithospheric, deep lithospheric fault zones where the, the pathways are for these uh, magmas to come up uh, through conduit systems. We want um, large amounts of magma where we've got large magma flows. So any sulfide that is um, produced can be enriched in those metals due to um, a large amount of silicate magma sulfide interaction. And they tend to be hosted in ultramafic cumulates, so if we can find all those things, evidence of crustal contamination, uh, then these are all our sort of key ingredients for finding a nickel sulfide deposit. So, with that background, on to um, Manali. Manali um, is situated in southern Zambia, um, and if I put that, um, that map up again, here it is. Uh, it's just on the northern edge of the Zimbabwe, Kraton in southern Zambia. Um, it's hosted by Mesoproterozoic Zambezi belt. So this is one of those belts that opened up um, as a rift system um, as Rodinia was breaking up, deposited met sediment, um, well deposited sediments uh, during that opening of the basin and the magmatism happened around about that same time during rifting. So it's a, a classic example of what I've been talking about. And if we um, have a look at one of the, uh, this is a, a simplified geological map of Zambia. Uh, for those of you familiar, the Lufilian Arc or the, the Copper Belt is up at the top here. Um, Lusaka, the capital is around about here. And in this uh, region uh, to the south of Lusaka, we have the Zambezi Belt, which is um, made up of metasediments. Um, and there are also some pretty significant um, fault systems and shear zones, and Manali is sat right on one of them. Okay, so the setting is that this is um, just like the, the cartoon from the Steve Barnes paper here. Uh, we've got opening up rifting, magmas coming up through those fault systems. This was the setting around about um, 880, 860. We've got Kalahari, Kraton and the Congo, Kraton uh, moving apart. We've got these fault systems, we've got basin development, so we've got sedimentation and we've got magnetism. And Manali um, is involved um, as part of that mafic, ultramafic magnetism at the time. But that's not the end of the story, of course because that Zambezi belt is no longer a nice little sedimentary basin. I mentioned before they are meta sediments. And of course, everything in the region has been subject to Pan-African uh, deformation. So in this case, around about 550 to 520, when all those sort of normal faults, they can get reactivated as reverse faults as well. So these deposits, they can form in these sort of um, uh, extensional regimes, but they are often therefore later um, subject to deformation where those continents come apart, they can also uh, smash back together again. So um, in terms of a regional context, um, this is the sort of, uh, we've got um, from a billion, so half a billion years here, um, our basement rocks in the Manali Hills, our granites, are they're around about a billion years old. The key period is in here, um, this is where the rifting starts about 880 and we've got um, basinal sediments um, in place, um, sorry, um, uh, basinal sediments deposited and um, Manali in place at about 860. Um, so this is what it looks like, this is a geological map, it's quite typical of these sort of um, nickel sulfide hosting intrusions. It's not huge, it's nowhere near a bush field. it's a couple of kilometers um, long by a, a few hundred um, meters uh, wide. These squares on here, these are kilometer um, squares. This is quite typical for these sort of nickel deposits. It's made up of a barren gabbro in the middle, which is the, the green unit there, and some ultramafic, mafic um, breccia units um, towards the margin, which are those in pink. And there are four main uh, deposits. Um, we've got Enterprise, this is where the mine is situated. 
Um, we've also got Voyager, Intrepid and Defiant. If any of you are Star Trek fans out there, that's uh, obviously where those came from. The host unit um, enveloping this is this uh, blue marble unit. So we're sat in a marble, which has got pyrite. There are other meta sediments um, surrounding it, which you've got schists, um, carbonate, pyrite, and scapolite as well. So I'll come back to the scapolite because that might be uh, important uh, later on. So, okay, how big is this resource? Well, if we put up one of these um, uh, maps, so Daryl's um, compiled this, um, various uh, different nickel um, PGE sulfide deposits. We've got the giants out here, Norilsk and Sudbury, the big PGE deposits, which of course have lowish nickel grade, but their production and resources are big. And we've got the Platte Reef in there as well. Um, and so Manali sits here, so it's a, a modest size, but it is worth pointing out that that is just the resource from Enterprise. So if we flick back, that's not the, um, that's not the intrusion in deposit as a whole, it's just the part that we have a resource for. Um, so there's a potential that might sort of squeeze up and get towards sort of Kabanga. Um, uh, but that's this sort of uh, region uh, that we're looking at in terms of the size of the deposit. And the host rocks, um, as I said, we've got a, um, a, it's like a cross section now looking along strike. You can see things dipping quite steeply. We've got a central gabbro unit and then in this um, more brecciated uh, unit, we've got a mafic, ultra mafic. Uh, complex, which is quite complex. Um, we've got poikilitic gabbros in there, olivine gabbros, dunites, and some uh, unusual ultramafics, which have apatite and magnetite in them, some whirlites. And if you plot these up, these are all um, little plots versus MGO. And if I just pluck one out, uh, this is one of the, uh, uh, the alkalis versus MGO. You can see what looks like quite a nice little fractionation trend from your ultra mafic high MGO is going to your more mafic um, uh, low MGO uh, numbers with higher plagioclase and things like that. Actually, it's the other way around. Um, the earliest rocks are actually the gabbros and this system tends to uh, get more magnesium rich um, as we go along. So we, we, point, we found this out in the, uh, in the field, there were cross-cutting relationships where it looked like the gabbro was early and the ultra mafic was actually late and um, so we did a little bit of dating work found some zircons which is a little bit unusual uh, or hard to do in certainly in ultra mafic rocks and that did confirm that the central gabbro is a little bit earlier than the ultra mafic and they are just about almost within error effectively we can look at this as a system where manali is about 860 million years old and we start with a cabroic intrusion and then we progress to these more um, ultramafic rocks as, as we go through. Now, crustal fault systems was something that I mentioned was uh, uh, important. Um, so Manali is sat along one of those, the Manali fault, which I'll just highlight here. This is the lower one out of those two dashed lines. This is Manali here. This is a magnetics map regional magnetics. This is a, a major magnetic anomaly. There's loads of sulfide and there's loads of magnetite at Manali, so it makes a, a beautiful um, uh, anomaly there. You might notice as well that there are other prospects along both the Manali Fault and these other ones, which are also um, uh, prospective intrusions. So a little bit of um, history of Manali. So it was uh, discovered back in the summer of 69 uh, by Chartered Exploration. Um, Anglo did some follow-up work, some trenching in the 90s, which you can still see on Google Earth if you pick a time where it's the dry season. Um, and then in 2002, Albadon uh, began extensive exploration over there and in a lot of um, the region across uh, Southern Africa, they did a lot. Uh, people like Dave Evans and Rocky Osborne, who I think is on the call, uh, involved in, in, in that exploration. Um, bankable feasibility study was completed in uh, 2000. 2006 and the mine opened in 2008 but it only lasted a few years before it was placed on care and maintenance um, so there were some uh, various problems that, 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 that caused that. Jin Xuan purchased Albedon in 2014 and then consolidated Nickel Mines um, who's a UK based company they took over the operations. Uh, did a revised feasibility study uh, made uh, uh, determined a new geological model 
um, with a new resource. So the geological model was one of the things that was uh, problematic. And in particular, uh, CNM introduced some new processing methods, which made the operation um, a lot more um, uh, a lot more um, attractive economically. And that's where we stepped in, um, in terms of uh, applied research. Um, so uh, we got involved at Leicester, um, working with CNM and Nabiza, um, who are the, the operating company in, in Zambia, uh, through a number of um, master's projects to begin with, Grace Howe, Chloe Mitchell, and then Laura Ward, all worked on the sort of regional prospectivity, some exploration techniques and sulfide uh, mineralization. And then the success of that then developed into um, a PhD um, studentship, which is um, currently being done by Daryl Blanks. Uh, Daryl worked on the on the project, and when CNM took over, doing some um, relogging of all of the underground core, um, and then switched over to um, to undertake research on it. So um, she's now in that final year of the PhD. So we can watch this space for some papers coming out of that, and some of the stuff that I'm going to show you um, in the next part of the talk. Um, are the results from that ongoing uh, research. And then um, last year, around right about Easter time, uh, the mine reopened and has been operating ever since. They've been producing a nickel concentrate and also a PG uh, copper concentrate. So um, uh, uh, it is, um, yeah, the operating mine at the moment. There's a little leaflet from there when the, uh, the president came and officially cut the Cut the ribbon or, or, or pull the string to, to reveal to reveal the plaque. Um, new um, underground resource drilling as well going on and developing deeper and deeper into the ore body. And so if I um, let's have a look at the, the deposit itself now, some of the characteristics and the geology. And um, if I put this map back up just to remind you, so we're looking uh, sort of northwest southeast, and we've got a gabbro core and an ultramatory here on the other side. So um, in the field, um, sat in the middle of that gabbro, looking towards where the mine is. And there it is down here. These are the Manali Hills. This is basement granite. The big Manali fault basically follows the breaking slope um, along there. And we've got marbles around the outside. We turn around. Um, this is one of the Gossens um, up here. And we've got the gabbro and ultramafic unit. Those photos taken in the wet season. And that's the uh, the equivalent dry season, which is a lot easier for doing some field work, as you as you can guess. Um, and the majority of the um, exploration and resource work and the mining itself has been done on this um, southern margin. There is a little bit of mineralization on the northern margin, but it's much thinner. Um, so things have been focused on that southern part. Um, one of the projects that we had early on. Uh, took a load of the drill core data and did some 3D modeling to uh, have a look at that breccia unit which hosts the sulfides um, and found that it was a little bit inconsistent. It pinched and swelled. It's most consistent where that enterprise mine is but there are some interesting looking uh, parts of it elsewhere. And if we look along strike, just to show you that uh, dip, it's a pretty steep dip and we have a footwall gabbro then we've got the mineralized unit, and then we've got those meta sediments as a hanging wall. So I'm going to show you some, um, some pictures from underground. If you think that the foot wall is a barren gabbro, and then we've got the mineralized unit sat on top of that. And with the, um, with the mine being on uh, care and maintenance for the majority of the time that we've been working there, it's given us the um, excellent opportunity of going underground. Um, and really getting to grips with what is a complex um, ore deposit. Um, so we can do a lot of face mapping, which has um, huge benefits, of course, over, over just having a drill core, uh, particularly for a deposit like this. So being able to walk through the deposit and see the three dimensions of it um, has been really beneficial in us trying to get our head around um, uh, this deposit. So. Um, We've been doing a lot of face mapping. This is one of Daryl's uh, face maps uh, from underground. And you can see the footwall gabbro is this green unit. The orange is sulfide. So you can see there are some sulfide sheets. And the purple in here is ultramafic. And this stuff is, um, the gray stuff out here is uh, mafic, part of that 
breccia unit, you can see things are, are fractured. Um, and the sulfide is the matrix. Okay, the critical thing is that these are sulfide matrix uh, breccias. So sulfide makes up the matrix, and you can see that it seems to infiltrate down into cracks um, and into uh, blocks um, of, the, of the host rock. So what I'm saying is here, these are not like reef deposits where we have um, uh, disseminated sulfides within cumulates. Uh, we have evidence with this sulfide liquid, um, which is um, infiltrating this um, this yeast unit. And you see these brecciation textures, and you see them at different scales as well. So I'm going to that's some core, obviously. So I'm going to put on top of that one of these um, face maps, and you can see similar sort of um, uh, brecciation style that was a, a meter high face a 15 meter high face and you can see the same thing on the centimeter scale but on all of these it is the sulfide that forms the matrix and you can see it going into these um ultramafics and disaggregating them looks like it's plucking off um little blocks of that ultramafic so whenever you have a breccia question is are these tectonic or are these magmatic well um maybe a little bit of both but we've certainly got infiltration of sulfides along cracks you can see these um uh what we're referring to as hard walled breaches um which looks like fractures which sulfide has infiltrated into we can get some great cross-cutting relationships here there's a carbonate vein across a gabbro with sulfide around it so we've got sulfide after carbonate which is after the gabbros um i'll come to the carbonate in a minute um and we also have evidence of uh, what, what we refer to as um, soft walled brecciation. So over here we've got these um, uh, uh, more, rather than the hard walled fracture fills, these are more um, uh, rounded um, infiltration there down, down in that uh, picture. And what this is evidence for is for the sulfide penetrating, not just in the fractures, but it's also melting the foot all rocks and this is quite common in these nickel sulfide deposits here's another couple of examples and sulfide liquids are hot and very corrosive basically they will eat through um, anything um, and you see towards the base of nickel sulfide deposits where you've had um, uh, sulfide liquids they are eating into those foot wall rocks and plucking out um, xenoliths and floating off xenoliths um, very high temperature stuff and the, the viscosity of, of the sulfide liquid is something is similar to water as well. So the, the liquid is extremely hot um, melts. So if we have a look at the ore mineralogy at Manali, it is in some ways quite typical, but in other ways really quite unusual. So this is a little compilation that Daryl's put together of some of the styles. Um, we've got ultramafics with what looked like a bit normal, more pyrotite pentadite, chalcopyrite, sort of fractionated blebs. We've got the massive sulfides there. Uh, we've got the, um, uh, the xenoliths of the um, ultramafics floating around. We've got some magnetite in those massive sulfides. Um, one of the things, one of the characteristics of Manali is appetite. There is a lot of appetite in there. So this is a, a large appetite, chlorine rich appetite, uh, which I'll come back to. Um, and also carbonate, um, what looks like primary dolomite um, and calcite in there, um, along with the sulfides, which is quite unusual. So a lot of the time I'm saying that this is quite a typical style of deposit. Uh, there are some aspects which are unusual. The platinum group minerals, they're pretty normal. Um, you have more than 90% of the, what, what's been recorded so far are tellurides, platinum or palladium tellurides, uh, so Monskyite, and Marenskyite and Katulskite, uh, for those of you who uh, like, a, like a PGM. Very rare sperolite. Uh, hardly any gold, which I will also come to. Um, and they're sat within the sulfides. Okay, so this is actually, these are pretty typical textures of, of tellurides with primary looking pyrotype and like chunk of pyrite. Uh, but the appetite is unusual and um, there's a lot of appetite in there. We see that, so this is all this whitish pinkish stuff is appetite with chalcopyrite around it in a massive sulfide. We've got 
centimeter scale, even up to 10 centimeter scale appetites floating around in the ore body. And we think that they've been disaggregated from the ultramafics because the ultramafics have some appetite in them as well. And there's carbonate in there, which is again quite unusual. So we've got sulfide here, brecciating uh, blocks of ultramafic here with sulfide in there, but also you can see little bits of what appear to be interstitial calcite uh, within that sulfide. So we do have evidence there of some uh, carbonate melts um, kicking around. Um, the, there is a, a whole story in itself there. Uh, but that is one of the unusual uh, aspects of mineral that we are actually working on. Now, if we have a look at the sulphide ore mineralogy itself, these are some fabulous uh, images. These are um, generated using micro XRF or tornado uh, maps. These were done at uh, CSIRO in Perth. Uh, Daryl did a, um, an internship there with Steve Barnes. Um, and these are the sorts of images that we produce out of these. This is uh, chemical mapping. So we've got nickel, copper and sulphur there. Basically the blue on here is pyrotite, the pink is pentlandite and the green is chalcopyrite there. So these neon ravey colours. Um, these are beautiful magmatic textures with these what we refer to as loops, pentlandite loops. Um, these are high temperature um, uh, cooling text, uh, uh, textures. But we don't always get this. We do have evidence of deformation. So we can see in these ones, you can see the pentlandite is located along fabrics. Okay, so these shear fabric. Note also that there's no chalcopyrite in that sample. We've also got pentlandite here sort of um, uh, being uh, concentrate around the margins. Um, and then in these two, we do have some chalcopyrite, but it appears like it might have been, certainly in this one, there's a, got a beautiful shear fabric, which appears to um, put the chalcopyrite in certain bands uh, compared with the pyrotite and these pentlandite. So that's, I will return to as well. And there's plenty of evidence for ductile deformation and shearing when you go underground. Um, there are faults in there, there are shear zones, there are um, lots of talc carbonate alteration, there are kinematic indicators down there. There is a lot of information um, which shows that this deposit has undergone, um, at least in parts, um, a significant amount of deformation. And that, that's what we would expect because um, it was emplaced at 860 and about 850, 820, I'm sorry, 550, 520, we've got the Pan-African. And this Manali fault, which I mentioned before, is probably one of those um, normal faults opening up during rifting. And what happens is that um, during the Pan-African, that gets reactivated as a high angle reverse fault. So uh, we've got the Manali intrusion right next to that fault. So it's going to undertake some uh, deformation. And we've got evidence for that. And um, so that was our critical period of sedimentation and emplacement. But we've also got a key period there of deformation. Now, the question is, what are the key controls on the nature of the ore body now? Um, are we looking at something where we need to focus on primary magmatic um, interactions or, or is the deformation actually um, uh, caused a significant um, effect on what we're looking at? And this is where we come into um, a slightly unusual uh, aspect of, of the deposit. So um, in general, this is a very sort of classic craton margin deposit. But when we look at the sulfides and the sulfide geochemistry, chemistry, um, things are a little bit um, unusual. So that is, this is a, a diagram of, of nickel and copper tenors. Um, this is a compilation again from Steve Barnes. Um, and you can see that Manali, its bulk composition, which is the star, sits actually in the Kamatiite field. Well, it's not a Kamatiite. Um, it's just, very just on the edge of that mafic part. And maybe this is just the way it is. This is a source characteristic. Or maybe we're a little bit deficient in copper. We'd probably think that Manali should probably fit up here a little bit with a bit more copper for that amount of nickel. Um, I'll come back to these. Um, actually, no, I'll mention those now. So these diamonds are samples that Daryl's taken, individual samples from around the deposit. And you can see that roughly they have similar nickel tenors, 
but have a huge variation of two orders of magnitude in terms of copper tenors. So where you take a sample from that ore body, the amount, whether you've got copper in it or not is, is very um, hit and miss. But that's probably telling us something. Um, if we plot copper tenor versus palladium tenor, palladium tenor, like nickel tenor, is quite consistent. There is the bulk rock again, it's sitting uncomfortably, I would say, within the Camartiite field. And it's like, well, actually, we should probably have it coming a bit further this way, maybe. Um, in other words, a little bit more copper. So do we have a deficiency of copper here? Um, or are we nickel rich? Well, if we're nickel rich, we're also palladium rich. So it's probably that we're actually looking at something which um, we're looking at, which is quite copper poor. Now, remember that this is um, those bulk um, uh, values, which are in the red circles, those are um, uh, bulk uh, for enterprise only and the resource that that has been drilled and defined okay so it's not necessarily the whole thing uh, um, and again this is maybe a clue as to to we're, we're, we're maybe missing something here so um this is another one of uh, daryl's plots we've got um uh, the the background values this is bulk nickel versus copper those are the, the sort of the background rocks unmineralized and then these rocks here have got some sulfide in so disseminated sulfide and they seem to have trapped a relatively consistent nickel copper ratio of just under 10 maybe about eight nine something like that but then once you get to the some samples which have got sulfide in some of them got nickel copper ratios like less than less than two up there and some of them are up to almost a hundred and um, so we've got copper poor copper rich and some intermediate ones so once we get into that sulfide itself it's actually quite heterogeneous in terms of its nickel and copper but we can make some generalizations here. So if you plot up the um, chalcophile element geochemistry and normalize it against primitive mantle, this is what we normally do for, and um, it's like a, a sort of a chalcophile spider plot kind of uh, thing. So we've got nickel and cobalt over here, and then we've got the PGEs, gold and copper. And you tend to get sort of slopes which go up. I put Jin Chuan on there because it's a, another nickel sulfide deposit actually formed at the same time. Um, and you usually get a, a peak around about platinum palladium in the PG reefs and then um, might go up um, in some of the uh, nickel uh, and copper PG um, the sulfide dominated deposits but what, not, what we see at Manali is a real deficiency in what we might expect for per copper I mean there's a few of those samples which are the copper rich ones obviously um, which almost go to what we would expect, but the majority are really copper depleted and we are extremely gold depleted. Um, no gold minerals found in any of the precious metal searches so far and a lot of the time the bulk gold is really quite close to detection limits and we wouldn't expect that. Most nickel copper PGE deposits have some gold in. Um, so the question then is where is the copper and gold? Is it missing? Are we missing something here? Is the, I mean, it might just be an inherent source characteristic, which is a bit unusual, but that's a possibility. Uh, but maybe there's something else going on here and we've got evidence of a hidden uh, deposit somewhere else. So we're gonna have a poll on this. Um, so Nolene's gonna put up a poll in a few slides time. Um, where is the copper? Okay, so option number one, Okay, um, we, and you can you can vote for your favourite in a moment. So option number one is defamation. Okay, uh, we got plenty of evidence of that. So I'm, I'm going to state the case for the defamation now. And um, these are some of the country rock marbles. We can see that these are um, isoclinally folded. Some of the other um, meta sediments in drill core, and these these are uh, lamprophires, which have sat along the Manali fault that we've identified. Which are actually this is a sheath fold. We've got a sheath fold in here, so huge amounts of uh, high strain along that Manali fold. We've got lots of uh, evidence of deformation underground as well, and we've got evidence here 
on the sort of micro scale of copper maybe separating during that um, deformation. So if you like that as, a, as an option, what that would mean, what, what we would be implying there is that somewhere in Manali, maybe in the eroded bit, but maybe deeper down or a long strike, um, this copper has been mobilized by deformation and separated away from the main nickel resource that is being mined at the moment. Okay, so that's option one. Option number two is a pure magmatic sulfide fractionation. So the interstitial sulfides look quite normal. We've got pyrotite, pentandite, and chalcopyrite. But once we have a look at the massive sulfides, we've maybe got some evidence of some small scale movement or migration or separation of chalcopyrite, which is the blue, uh, green, uh, coming away from um, the pyrotite and pentlandite up here as well. That's a little, a little injection there of um, chalcopyrite. So got that on a small scale. Can that be um, scaled up to a deposit scale? Could it be that we're actually on a deposit scale? We're mining this part here, but there might be one of these further down or a long strike or whatever and the answer is well quite possibly this is Sudbury um, not at the same scale as this little centimeter scale sort of bleb but it's it's pretty much a good um, comparison <laughs> almost the same shape because Sudbury is a nickel sulfide deposit but most of the copper the copper rich ores are actually formed in these what are called offset dikes where so copper rich sulfide has infiltrated into the floor and the reason that that happens is because you can crystallize the nickel rich portion at a higher temperature so that can be crystalline and then you have a little temperature window where the copper rich sulfide is still liquid and it can migrate and it could migrate away from the nickel portion. So in a lot of deposits, so Sudbury is, a, is one example, uh, Sakati is another one, parts of the Rills complex as well, you get copper rich deposits sort of moved away from uh, the nickel rich deposits. So do we have that Manali? So the big implication for mining there is that we're currently mining um, a nickel rich deposit, but maybe there's a copper rich deposit and uh, nearby. So that's option two if you fancy that one. And option three, those of you who maybe fancy a more hydrothermal um, way of getting rid of copper and, and, and gold, um, there's a lot of scapolite in the area which is a chlorine rich um, mineral, metamorphic mineral. We've got evidence uh, potentially of evaporites in that um, set of entry sequence. In fact the occurrence of the scapolite is often um, uh, attributed to the presence of, of um, evaporites in that sedimentary sequence. All that appetite that I was showing you is chlorine rich. Um, so maybe we've got chlorine rich hydrothermal fluids kicking around, maybe during emplacement, maybe during deformation, maybe post emplacement, but we, the, there's maybe an argument to make there. Now, you've got chlorine rich hydrothermal fluids, which elements are easily mobilized in chloride complexes. Well, gold is uh, and copper is. And which two elements are we kind of missing at Manali? Well, it's the gold and the copper. Now, we may be stretching it a little bit here, but just to add this to, to if, if you like this story, this might, this might capture you even more. So um, a long strike of the Manali fault, there are actually, there's a sediment hosted copper deposit and there are some art, um, uh, some gold vein deposits as well. We don't know the age of those, but um, there's a possibility that they sink if we've mobilized our copper and gold from uh, Manali. Might be that um, it's, gone, it's gone to there. So, time for some audience participation now. We're, we're at the point where um, we are exploring all of these. So, the copper at Manali, where is it, everyone? Lack of copper, is it because of defamation? It's that Pan-African deformation and we've moved the copper away um, during shearing. Is it a pure magmatic sulfide fractionation like in um, uh, Sudbury? Um, is it hydrothermal remobilization? So those are the three options. Um, you could um, uh, go for the classic, well, it's a little bit of two or more of them. That's, that's your option four. 
Uh, or you can go for the bottom option, which is none of the above. I have a better idea, in which case, please, please let us know at the end of this. It looks like I can actually submit it. I'm going to vote myself, but not tell you which one I'm voting for. <laughs> actually, no, I just changed my mind. Here we go. OK, so we'll see, we'll, we'll see what the results of their, those are um, uh, in a moment. Uh, OK, so to wrap up, uh, in many ways, Minali is one of these classic craton margin nickel sulfide deposits. Um, it's on a major crustal fault system. It was formed during um, a supercontinent breakup. We've got mafic ultramafic magmas. We've got sulfide there in the ultramafic portion. Uh, we have got some unusual aspects about that, um, that ultramafic. Um, but we have sulfide matrix breccias, which are, again, quite classic around the margins of these intrusions. But we've also got some evidence of um, Pan-African deformation. What um, impact that has had on the actual resource and maybe the copper nickel ratio is something that we're still working on. Um, but it is fair to say that this is a relatively nickel rich and or copper poor um, uh, deposit, at least the portion that we know of at the moment. But the drilling and the uh, mine development is not exhaustive, it's still open, um, and it could mean that we have uh, a more copper rich ore body somewhere um, in the system still to discover. And maybe that copper rich deposit also has some gold in it, um, and maybe some PGs um, as well. Um, so there we go in summary. So um, just uh, to wrap up um, and say thanks again to um, Ibiza Resources at Manali Mine and Consolidated Nickel Mines for um, supporting the research that we're doing um, and um, the work that we've been doing through those uh, uh, projects um, and postgraduate research that Daryl's been doing um, as well. So um, thank you very much. And I think we're open to poll results and questions, Nolene, about that. Would anybody else like to throw in their answer there? We not quite at 100% of people who have voted. So if you're still busy thinking. Okay. <laughs> no? Okay, I'm going to end the poll now. How exciting. <laughs> you all get an acknowledgement on the paper now. <laughs> oh, look at that. Hydrothermal, whoa, that, that's the winner then. Hydrothermal, oh, you, you liked the copper and gold, didn't you, moving along there, moving along the fault. Okay, some are all of the above. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, and looks like one person has a better idea. So, okay, on that, should we open it up to some questions? Tanya, Nolene? Are there any questions, Tanya? folks? You can either put on the, the chat line or you can just raise your hand. Uh, Jeremy, I'm not very good at raising my hand, so maybe I can... Go for it, Jeremy. <laughs> Hi, David. Um, first of Hi. all, congratulations for being associated with such a fantastic university as Leicester. Ah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I myself went there some 33 years ago. Oh, yeah? So anyway. Um, so Manali is a, is a quite interesting nickel deposit for me as a resource geologist because it has quite poor continuity. It's a bit of a mess, to be honest. Um, and I, I wonder why it's so, it's so discontinuous with these high-grade zones. And even there's a number of different directions in play at Manali as well. And in the back of my mind, I wondered if there was something to do with the, um, the marble, the, the, the carbonate unit. If that has something to do with some gases or something involved in there. And I, I wonder if you've got any thoughts on that. Uh, yeah, okay, so there's a few things in there. Yeah, it, uh, continuity is a thing. It's a, it, it is an unusual deposit. I mean, we, we published a paper a few years ago, which um, I think referred to it as a chaotic mega breccia. We moved on from there and there is a bit more continuity. Um, the maps that I showed you that Daryl has, has, has produced 
there are certain sulfide sheets um, or lenses which are actually you're you're able to follow those um, along strike um, quite a bit and also down through the levels of the mine. So we are getting a, a handle on some continuity um, of some of those sulfide sheets, but there is a lot of complexity in there. Undoubtedly, when you are in placing a hot magma into a carbonate um, host rock, there's going to be some devolatilization there. Um, I mentioned the carbonate that um, is in there. Um, we think there's a mantle component to some of that carbonate, but undoubtedly there is some um, carbonate and there would be a load of CO2 released um, during emplacement into those carbonate uh, sequences. So um, it is likely that there is a lot of um, volatile activity um, upon emplacement and the interaction of that with the sulfides, the breaches, and then of course the later deformation um, all adds up to yeah, a fairly complex um, deposit um, as opposed to let's say a nice little sulfide settling down and forming a reef. I don't know whether that's answered your question but I'm basically agreeing that um, yes the interaction of the, the, the magmas with the host rocks will have, will have caused a bit of volatile interaction. Yeah because I, I, I worked at Salibi Pickwee for many years, and um, oh, yeah. there's, uh, there's a lot of continuity in those ore bodies there at Salibi Pickwee. And, okay. and there's no, you know, there's, and it's a fairly similar setting, and it's also, you know, undergone a lot of deformation, you know, post, de post deposition. I mean, it's right in the Limpopo mobile belts, you know. But uh, it's got remarkable continuity considering the tectonic setting is in at Salibi Pickwee. Whereas Manali, I mean, you're sitting there in a similar situation, but when you look at the the grades of Manali, I mean, you can look at one side of a drive and the other side of a drive and get something quite different. Although you do get these these broad zones, you know, quite good continuity there, there in the, the middle piece there, but um, it just seemed very, very chaotic, I think is a good word in Local. As I said, when, after a couple of years of working on it, chaotic was the word that we were using, but now we're even f further down the line, um, we're starting to see the wood for the trees now, I think. Um, so there is a bit more continuity and it does take a while to get the eye in and yeah, it, it's targeting those um, sheets really, obviously between the sheets, <laughs> so to speak, um, you've got um, uh, mostly magmatic rocks with um, and, and you know if you if you talk about grades it's on sort of what scale away from the sheets where you've got a massive sulfide and you have a relatively um, consistent uh, grade or tenor if you like there when you come into the the blocks of ultramafic which have got veins going through it so on a small scale if you hit a vein then that's a fairly high grade on a larger scale so um, yeah, in between those um, those major sulfide sheets, um, it is a bit more difficult to, to predict, but I think we are getting somewhere. Um, and the, the more that the uh, development is, is happening now further down, we're starting to pick up, um, yeah, some, some uh, um, happy continuity in the ores. Okay, uh, David, we have, I mean, Jeremy, we have a, this David. We have another question from the other David. David Pollard, you've had your hand up. Would you like to go ahead and speak, please? Yes. Um, thank you very much, Dave, for your talk. I, I really appreciated it. Um, excellent talk. Um, the, the, I, I really wanted to carry on from what was previously stated and the, uh, the potential for the marble to, to change the pH of the, of the fluids and therefore the result of the change in the pH of the fluids, you then have the possibility of the, um, of the nickel uh, sulfides and copper sulfides dropping out um, as a result of that change in pH. And um, maybe the fact that um, the nickel sulfides 
are more inclined to drop out than the copper sulfides and therefore the, so the copper sulfides just carried on in, in solution and, and bypassed the system. Um, what is the possibility of that? You've got scapolite present, which is a typical SCARN mineral. You've got those uh, calcite uh, remnants. Um, it, it, it seems to point to that direction in my, my thoughts. Yeah, okay, so um, I think you, yeah, you, we're looking at something that, which is a much more magmatic process, but if I can um, expand a little bit. So all the evidence is that we have a magmatic sulfide liquid, um, which has uh, been introduced into the Manali ore body. It's not necessarily generated at that point, but it's definitely injected into. Now, at high temperatures, um, that is gonna, it, it's gonna be a homogeneous copper, nickel, PG rich sulfide liquid. Um, so once that starts to crystallize, now at this point, we've probably got a lot of volatile activity going on at the same time. Now, how those volatiles interact with that sulfide liquid, that might be the key of maybe moving certain elements and fractionating them away from what the sulfide liquid then crystallizes into because it crystallizes quite nicely into um, a pyrotite, uh, pentlandite, some chalcopyrite and those PGMs as well, those platinum palladium tellurides. However, it could be that interaction with those volatiles at that, at that stage could um, take away some of the gold, for example, because that is one thing that is really unusual. It is extremely low in terms of gold, and maybe that could do with the copper. But certainly there's probably a copper sulfide, um, magmatic copper sulfide there as well. Okay, we have a, another question here on the, on the chat line, which we'll take. Um, yep by um, Paul and I'm going to assume host privileges because this is very close to my heart as well. Are there any gemstones associated with the Manali nickel deposit? Gemstones? Um, mm, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, it uh, de de depends what you, what you refer to as a gemstone. There are some beautiful big um, appetites <laughs> in there. Um, but uh, if you're thinking about those, um, I don't know, sort of metamorphic um, minerals, um, uh, no, I would say. Okay, um, there's a, another um, question here, also on the on the chat line uh, from from Pavel who says, how far is the nearest evaporite evidences from the Manali deposit? What do you think about the source of sulfur for such big volumes of sulfides in the deposit? In Norils, there is an anhydrite suite over the sulfide ore approximately three to 600 meters. Great question. Okay, so, um, the evidence for the evaporites uh, is usually um, attributed to the large amount of scapolite um, that is both within the intrusion and in the um, host rocks. Um, I can see Dave Evans is there. Dave, uh, Dave Evans did, did quite a bit of work on some of the some of the scapolites around there. So it is thought, though, there's no evidence anymore of those um, uh, evaporites within. The carbonate unit. So we've got marbles, but it's thought that either during the emplacement or during metamorphism, those um, uh, those evaporites um, uh, were destroyed. Um, so the evidence is the sort of smoking gun of all the chlorine-rich um, metamorphic uh, minerals. Um, as to a source of sulfur, yes, they would be a source of sulfur if we've got anhydrite there. Um, but um, I'm going to mention something that I didn't mention, but Daryl's also been doing some sulfur isotope work um, on this. And there is a really nice story in there which seems to link um, the host rock marbles, um, which have a lot of pyrite in them, 
um, which have a very similar signature to the sulfur uh, sulfides themselves. So the, the sulfides in the ore deposit, yes, definitely show a crustal signature. So um, in going back to, to what I was talking about right at the beginning, if you have crustal contamination from external sulfur, that's a great way of generating your sulfides. And we think that that's happening here at Manali. Certainly there's pyrite in those marbles, but whether um, we had an anhydrite um, uh, source as well, it's possible, but we've not found anything convincing yet in that metasedimentary sequence that really looks like um, an evaporite, but it may be because it's, it's gone. George, George, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Please. Thank you, Tanya. Thanks for a great talk, uh, David. Um, I might have missed it, but um, did you mention uh, the how much um, tonnage uh, of ore there is and the grades of the nickel and the copper and the PGMs uh, that they're mining at present? Um, it was on that diagram. I don't know it off the top of my head, but I'm just going back to the slide. So, uh, yeah, the resource, is, the grade is um, just above 1% nickel. Um, and the nickel copper ratio is close to 10 to 1. Um, but the PGEs are relatively high. So the PGE tenors, um, so the grades of the sulfide, if you like, um, palladium is between about 1 and 3 uh, ppm. So the... Um, revised um, one in 2016 was uh, 5.6 million tons at 1% nickel. Um, so that was the, the, the one at 2016. Um, so that, that gives you an, an idea at the moment. Thank you very much. Nevin, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question, please? Thanks, Tanya. Hi, David. Uh, thanks for an interesting talk. Um, yeah, I, I last visited the deposit when it was still in the Albedon days. So it is a deposit that seems to keep coming back. Um, I, I think one of the curiosities at the time was the, uh, there were some pretty large olivine grains, megachristic olivines. Uh, and I was wondering if any further work was done on the origin of those. Yeah, so um, the there are some um, uh, large olivines in the, the ultramafic rocks. Um, there are also lots of greenish appetite as well, which is potentially misidentified um, um, underground. Um, but the, the ultramafic rocks are really quite coarse grained. They have large um, uh, olivines in there. Um, yes, we've been doing some work on that because we're trying to work out the origin um, of these ultramafics. Um, we think there might be some sort of uh, fluid or metasomatic um, activity going on, which might explain the very high, uh, the very large grain size of them. Um, it's a story which probably would go into another talk. Uh, but yeah, we are working on those. In terms of their um forsterite nickel content they look like um not hugely primitive um but uh, the nickel contents are a little bit low so they would support the separation of a sulfide liquid from them um but uh yeah we are working on those uh, there, there is another story behind those as you as you might be getting the theme Manali, uh, in one way, looks look, looks classic, but then you start to dig deeper, and it 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 has lots of secrets. <laughs> Thanks, David. Are there, are, are there any more questions? Uh, hello, hello. It's David Evans here. David. I I can't find a way to raise my hand, so uh, I'm going to have to butt in. Um, no just uh, continuing on, uh, continuing on uh, the question that um, David has just answered. Uh, another, you know, as he says, the closer you look, uh, the more weird this deposit becomes. 
And the other weird thing I could point out, which I could also ask uh, David to comment on, is um, the fact that these so-called ultramafics are so chromium poor. Not only are the olivines extremely large and, uh, you know, euhedral, um, as if they've been recrystallized in a pegmatoidal kind of way, um, they're also associated almost exclusively with titanium magnetite and not with chromite. So even though, as you say, the, um, the, what, the force strike content's about 80, so it's a, a, a sort of a moderately, uh, but not very primitive uh, composition, um, it's still more magnesium than you would expect with the, uh, the very high iron association, iron titanium association, which you tend to get. The olivine is usually associated with this titanium magnetite. So, yeah. and together with the apatite, can you comment on uh, this association of low chromium and um, high titanium? Yes, so I know I know what you're getting at here, and I, I sort of stayed away from this because it, it, again it's another talk in itself. <laughs> we have a series here, so the um, the bulk rock um, chromium values for those ultramafics are extremely low. Um, they are less than 100 ppm, which is not what you would expect in any ultramafic, except perhaps um, phosphorites. Um, now we did explore this um, because they petrologically magnetite, apatite, um, olivine rocks are, that's what phosphorites are. Uh, we've got that um, carbonate in there. So we, we did go down the, the route of investigating a phosphorite carbonatite sort of influence. Um, the, those olivines, as you say, they, they, they look, they're coarse grained and they, I have a, a, a moderate um, uh, force right content. Um, so, uh, yeah, the question is, are these actually phosphorites? We, we, we don't think so now because the appetite is not anywhere. Daryl's done them work on the, the appetite geochemistry and they are nowhere near the sort of carbonatite phosphorite field. So we're, we're sort of... Um, at the point where we've got a bit of information there, which is really sort of pushing back against that. That said, um, there are other things. So the, the, the chrome depletion remains. If they're not phosphorized, why do we not have the chrome? So one possibility is um, we've maybe got some chromite somewhere else, but actually I don't think that works. There is a lot of magnetite there, and there are examples, um, I think, in... China of complexes where when you fractionate a lot of magnetite early chrome can partition into the magnetite and you can deplete your magma of chrome by um, early magnetite um, fractionation so that might be a possibility because there is a lot of magnetite in there um, but yeah as you say these are unusual ultramafics um, which could be um, classified as phosphorite but genetically um, we're not, not quite convinced of that at the moment. Does that answer your question or, or, or get at what you were, you were thinking, Dave? Well, partly, yeah, yeah. I, I actually wasn't thinking of the uh, carbonatite um, link, okay. but um, it's just a puzzle, you know, because the low chromium also goes with low iridium. In, you showed the PG uh, diagrams, and That's not true. only is there a low gold co content, but there's a much higher palladium to iridium ratio than you would expect from a comatiite, for example. It, they look that's... very much like a, a mafic uh, or even an evolved mafic. Um, uh, the sulfides have come from an evolved mafic uh, magma. So mm -hmm. the, the low iridium as well as the low gold, which I, I, I voted for the everything <laughs> okay i think it's a combination of everything that re results in the low copper but um i think uh, 
there's a story in the iridium as well as the gold. Uh, yeah, but I would guess that this is a very early part of the story. The, the low chromium and the low uh, iridium, uh, probably that indicates that there's been some very early fractionation of chromite, perhaps. And that has uh, depleted the, the resultant magma. Um, and that you know that's where the current uh, what the sulfides that you're seeing now have come from yeah i mean that um, that, would, that would get rid of potentially the the ipgs which tend to have an affinity with chromite so, yeah yeah okay thanks very much i've got yeah. loads of other questions but i'll leave uh, <laughs> that for another <laughs> time <laughs> all right are, are there any other questions Going once, going twice, sold. David, thank you very, very much for a very interesting insight into the Manali nickel deposit. And you're Pleasure. welcome to come back and give one of those other talks that you were, were hinting at that you've got in your bottom drawer. <laughs> I, think, I think we've already sorted one, actually, on Katumba, <laughs> haven't we? Next we month. are indeed. Yeah, we've got you on already. Good yeah. stuff. So, Everybody, All thank right. you very much for coming to the GSSA lunchtime lectures. And again, we need to thank Peto Associates for their sponsorship this month. And we look forward to seeing you all again at the, the next lunchtime lecture. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, David. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Ta-da. Craig, you can end the meeting. I shall end the meeting now for everyone. Thanks a lot, everyone, for attending. Bye. All right.